Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome back to the Prince of Investment. Coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and city, city and state of Denver, Colorado via the beautiful city and state of Honolulu, Hawaii. And ladies and gentlemen, we got a great episode for you today. As you can already see in the description box, and as you already can see, um, well, wherever you probably saw it, in the uh, listing and everything else like that, we're going to be talking about home prices and will they go down? You know, right now we live in, in a society right now, we're coming out of the pandemic in 2020, a time where people thought, or I even thought myself that, man, housing prices are next, and it didn't really happen. So we saw housing prices actually going up to the point of, hey, it's leading people to think, what is going to happen now? So you know we live in a very low interest rate society, and you also know we live in a, a low interest rate society and a supply and demand crunch, especially here in Hawaii and other places around the country, leaving many people to wonder, who already own homes? Are we at the top of the housing market? Are we at the bottom of the housing market? What should I do? So without further ado, I'm going to bring my very, very special guest here today. Uh, he's right here in Denver with me. Delroy, how you doing? I'm good, man. Thank you for having me. It's honor to be here. Okay. Thank you. Definitely thank you for being on. Now for, you know, okay, I didn't, I kind of butchered your introduction there. He is a real estate expert. He's a real estate agent here in Denver, Colorado. So without further ado, I know he's, he can tell you more about himself than I can. So Delroy, tell people about yourself. Uh, yeah, I mean, you set me up there. You're saying I'm an expert, so I better make sure I come with some good information now. Uh, but yeah, I've been in residential real estate for about 14 years, uh, moved to Denver, Colorado about uh, 20 years ago. And, you know, uh, like you said, kind of on that intro there, lived through um, the recession that happened, which was the housing market crash um, and, and, you know, was firsthand in the mix and, and in the real estate business at that time to now be here and, and hustling and bustling. And, and I primarily focus on luxury real estate. So the high end uh, million dollar plus price range. But, I, you know, I, I work with anyone. Um, so I see kind of all sides of what's happening day to day in real estate kind of boots on the ground. And, you know, I just saw you, did you just sell a house for like 1.2, 1.3 million or something like that? You know, you know, we were out there kind of stalking you a little bit. Did you just sell a house for like 1.2, 1.3 million? Yeah, well, well, 1.375 uh, went on the market at 1.325. So 50, you know, almost 50 plus thousand dollars above the advertised price point. And the prior house that sold in that same row of homes sold for 1.2 uh, just last year, December. So massive price increase, and we have a happy client. <laughs> I, I bet. I got to ask you this question, right? We live in this low interest rate society. Mortgage rates are, I want to say that national average is around about 3%, but you're seeing people get about 2% on mortgages. 2%, 3% is very doable in this current economy. You're seeing houses just flying off of the market, especially out here in the Denver, Colorado area. Equity is just building up. What do you think? What do you... Do you think this is a, at a peak? You know, you think this is, is this overpriced? What do you, what do you got to say? What is the uh, next state of real estate you would say? Yeah, I mean, if we, if we go back for a second and just look at prior to the pandemic and when it first crept in, I, I did have that exact thought that you said, which is, is this back, are we back in 2009? Is this about to be a crash? Oh my goodness. Like I had that gut check and instinct myself. And really, really started thinking that for a moment. But then I, I took a moment to kind of step outside of just that feeling, because a lot of this stuff that happens is just a feeling. And then when I started looking at the data and what was happening in the marketplace, as soon as we came out of that initial lockdown, everyone had a mindset of, I need to move. I need more space. Housing is the most important thing um, to me. And I really need to make a decision. So people started getting out and moving and buying. And some people said, now nah, just stay. So the supply and demand issue started right there at that crux um, of that moment. And it really started shaping things. And like you said, the low interest rates were really pushing the buyers to say, I want something. But the initial past two years prior to this of the equity gain made a lot of people say, eh, you know, maybe I'll sell, maybe I won't. So we were at that middle ground of, of buyers versus sellers. And then the sellers ultimately won that war, as we can see in the market today. Hmm. Okay. Now, you just spoke about, you thought just like I did when you saw the pandemic 
and you saw, oh, I was like, hey, housing is next. People are losing their jobs, things like that. Now I have to ask you the question, what do you think is next in real estate? What's next? Yeah, so it, to, to analyze that, we have to really look at the data. The data basically says, on average, we have anywhere from three to five million homes on average across the country, right, in the USA, on the market at one time. Currently, we sit at around 300,000 active homes for sale. So we are pretty much at a 4 million you know, housing market shorted. We need 4 million homes to come onto the market for there to be even to back to where we're in norm in the last three years, which was still a seller's market, right? So if 4 million homes come on the market, we would still be in a somewhat seller's market. And that basically says to me that that's not going to happen. So for the next three years, and definitely in the short term, for the next one to two years, we will still see an increase in home prices. And we have a pretty long runway from what I can tell. Mm. Now, how do you feel, uh, you know, Jerome Powell, our Fed chair, he lowered interest rates in March of last year to an all-time reaching low. Now. With unemployment, weekly jobs reporters came out. Unemployment is starting to drop. When unemployment starts to drop and inflation is sitting about 2.4%, how do you feel when interest rates start to start back to increase? Do you think that it would make houses more unaffordable and that will cool down the market? How do you feel about those interest rates potentially raising and how it's going to affect the housing market? Sure. Um, so the rate changing is definitely something to watch, right? But if you actually look at the changes in the rates, they're down so much. And it has a, it has a direct impact in real estate um, rates. Rates go up by 1%. That basically removes about 10% of purchase power. So if it goes from 3% to 4%, on an average, let's say $500,000 home, you lose $50,000 of purchase power. Instead of you, nothing changes in the marketplace. You go out and try and buy a $500,000 home. Rate goes up 1%, you can now only afford a $450,000 home. Um, so we do see some slight movement um, in terms of when buyers are in the marketplaces and these adjustments are happening in rates. But the counter to that right now is home, people are overbidding 10%, 15% sometimes on homes right now. So even if that rate was to move up, it would still keep these prices where they were because people are already doing it essentially. And so that is baked into the rate going up or down. People can afford the average credit score of a home buyer right now is 750 credit scores. So these are, these are not uninformed purchasers. These are people that are used to managing debt. And, you know, this isn't about like what's right and wrong and, and who should it, like there's a whole different kind of analysis for that. But the, the people that are you know, losing a lot of their income, the hospitality field, the restaurant field, those in a big scope of things are not the majority of the home purchasers in these marketplaces. So those, the impacts of a lot of that job loss that's been happening throughout the USA, aren't all of those people aren't essentially the, the biggest portion of the home buyer's market. Mm. Okay. So essentially what you're saying is that uh, the people that were losing their jobs in hospitality and leisure um, were pretty much there. There were they were not the people that was buying the homes in the first place. Am I correct, correct. on that? Correct. Okay. Exactly. Yep. All right. So now I got to ask you this question. Now that we know we come to 2020, something just came out of the blue that we never thought would come, like it always happens. We come into a pandemic. You got to ask yourself this question. More people start working from home, more people are Zooming. You know, you, you take this show right here, the show used to be done face to face in person and things like that. Now you're seeing more podcasts, you're seeing more YouTube, you're seeing more Skypes, you're seeing more people meeting over FaceTime and things like that. Yep. Do you think this would have a great impact on commercial real estate? How do you feel about commercial real estate? Yes, um, definitely a much more of a bigger impact is coming and is happening right now. We we have a phrase that we're using behind the scenes now, and you'll probably start seeing it more. So we used to have what was called boom towns, where the baby boomers were buying up all the real estate. Right now, what we have is Zoom towns. People are moving to places 
where they can Zoom from work everywhere they're going. And there's all these kind of at-home workers hanging out and they're looking for different things. And Hawaii is a big place for this. Puerto Rico is a big place for this. A lot of people are moving to these places that can now just work remotely. So office space is either going to be repurposed into different uses that, you know, who knows what that's going to be. I'm hearing like in Denver right now where, where my market is, there, there is commercial space. Basically, a company is being built to have it almost an Airbnb for commercial space, right? So you could go and use the commercial space, have the entire office for the day and then leave again for, for bigger corporate meetings and stuff like that. So there, people are going to have to figure out new use for it. But overall, right now, commercial space is cheap. If you're in the market and you're looking for a building before, you probably can negotiate pretty hard and get a good deal. Um, I was actually speaking to an individual today who had the opportunity last year to purchase and panicked and, and was glad he didn't purchase at that time. But now the landlord, you know, there's a lot of vacancies and that buyer is saying, you know, I'll maybe still wait, you know, the pandemic, who knows? And the, the, the building has 50% vacancy. I told him, buddy, go and negotiate that deal and purchase it now because in three years, like you said, nobody knows. You can't predict this, right? In three years, it could all come back. There could be new uses. There could be different ways that people operate. Um, so again, like stocks, you, you're heavy into the stock game. But when everybody's running this way, you've got to go that way. You always need to you know, go opposite against the grain. So find the opportunity in the commercial space and make sure you have a use for it. Yeah, I get that. Be greedy when others are fearful. But be go. fearful when others are greedy. Hashtag shout out to Warren Buffett for that. Yep. But I can see what you're saying. You're saying that commercial real estate has to be repurposed, things like that. Now, what do you say to the person? Um, you know, majority of people that listen and tune in to this show is somewhere between 20 to 30, and they're right in that time of buying a house. Would you tell them, would you what would you what advice would you give them if they're saying, hey, you know, I don't know. Is this the right time? Is it a good time? What would you tell that person? Um, yes. 100% yes, and it is the right time to purchase a home if you can afford it and you're not over leveraging yourself. Those are the main things. If you can afford this market right now and you're not over leveraging yourself, go ahead and do the purchase. And I, always, I tell my clients this story. When I bought my first ever property, um, I bought my home in 2008. And at that time, it was the peak of the real estate market. I paid $135,000 for that property. And literally the, within three months, the homes around it were selling for 190 down to some of them $170,000. So I went through that struggle, obviously, and kept a hold of that property. Still own that property till this day. You know, the main thing is, can you afford it, right? Now that exact same property today is probably worth $600,000. So every single now, time- oh, I want to I stop you there for a second. Go ahead. Now you paid two thirty five for it. Yep. Now it's worth six hundred. Yep. How much do you owe on it now? I owe like one twenty. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I didn't refinance. I've never refinanced it. I just paid and just kept it. Let's give you a round of applause for that. A round of applause for that. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But Dara, what we're gonna do, ladies and gentlemen, I want you guys and girls to stay tuned. We're gonna take a quick break, and I mean a very quick break. And after the break, we're gonna talk about land, another golden goose of real estate, and whether you should be buying, holding, or selling. So y'all keep your lock right here. We'll be right back.
what's going to happen with home prices? Right now in 2021, we've come out of a pandemic and people are wondering, we're living a very low interest rates. Housing markets are shooting up all over the globe. People are wondering what's going to happen next. Should I buy a house? Should I hold a house? And should I sell a house? That's what we're talking about today's episode. If you missed us before the break, you missed a very good piece. But don't worry about it. You're going to get some more here. So what will happen with well, housing prices drop in 2021? We're here with live with right here in Denver, Colorado. We're here live with our real estate expert, Mr. Dilroy. How you doing today, sir? I'm good. I'm good. You're glad to be back. So yeah. now I got to ask you this question. You kind of touched on this earlier before the break. Will housing prices drop in 2021? No, the, the straight up answer for that is absolutely not. Definitely not this year. There is no indication and no data that supports house prices going down for 2021 in the short term. Why? What are you basing that upon? Um, so uh, everything, right? So we spoke about a lot of the, um, the supply and demand before that. The demand is very, very high. We have a four, basically 4 million um, home shortage. I think the, the, the other thing that people do talk about and think that could tip the housing market is there's a ton of people in forbearance that could go into foreclosure, right? So again, if we take the numbers, the 300,000 homes that are active on the market, we need to get to 4 million homes active on the market just for it to go back to the slight seller's market it was before. In forbearance, there's currently about 2.7 million people in forbearance. Let's just round out 3 million people in forbearance. If we were to take crazy stats, which has never happened, let's say 50% of those people, 1.5 million people went into foreclosure across the country, that would still only bring up the national average of active homes to 2 million, which is still not enough to even move it into a balanced real estate market. So though, though there just aren't any data points that show us that are going to swing the market in a, in a big enough trajectory for it to move into a, into a buyer's market, right? When we say home prices go down, that means it's going into a buyer's market. There just is such a low shortage of homes that it's just really, really hard for that to change right now. The builders and developers need to build more. I got to ask you this question. You spoke about forbearance. To the audience, what is forbearance? Forbearance is basically a program. It's always been around. So some people may think this is something new that the government just put together for the pandemic. This has been around for forever. And it means that if you get into any financial difficulty, you can ask the bank to defer your payments. Basically, you won't have to make payments for an extended period of time. Three months, six months, 12 months, depending on what you request and what you negotiate with your bank. And then at some point, you will have to pay that money back and every bank operates differently, but it could be rounded on to the back of your loan. You could have to pay a lump sum at the end of the negotiated period. So the forbearance is a time where they're forgiving that loan for a short period of time, but you will have to repay it. Okay. Now I want to ask you this question. We talked about commercial real estate. We even talked about residential real estate. Another piece of real estate that I think is a hidden gem. You know, you rarely see people talk about. What is what is your take on land? Yeah, land is definitely always a good asset to purchase um, if you can find it in urban settings in in closer town. Even better. Um, I I think one of the things because there, there's a lot of things in, in general. The 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 thought process would be land values have gone up over time, and it just depends on where the land is located upon how quickly it will go up. Meaning, is it in a state that has a lot of people moving there? How, how rapidly will they need use for the land? But I think something that people don't speak about is in areas where there are, let's say there's new builds and, and movement happening in a community and developers are coming in and neighborhoods are getting gentrified. And a lot of the times right now, sometimes in, the, in communities, People feel like I'm going to hold on to this house. I'm not selling it. And there is a land value there, no matter what, right? And that land is always going to go up in value. So two pieces, big box developers do what's called land banking. So if you in a, even in a city environment, sometimes you go out a little bit outside the city, you see cows and stuff walking around on land. 
that's owned by someone more than likely. And they have cows on there so they can save some money on paying taxes. Because as soon as they are going to develop on it, they are going to get hit with a whammy and change from agricultural land to development land. And they get, have to get paid. So that's why they keep it there. On an individual, if you are just a homeowner and you're trying to basically land bank in your home, it doesn't work the same way because what happens, the longer you hold on, once there's a ton of gentrification and new builds and different homes going up in that neighborhood, the home price actually decreases as the land value is going up. And homes increase in value quicker than land. So the longer you hold it, the less money you will actually receive um, mm -hmm. for that property. So it's just a good thing for people to understand that and think that, and don't think I'm holding on to this nugget because they want the house. Realistically, the people are buying it for land value at that point. Nice, good, good point there. Now I gotta ask you this, ask this question. Which one would you choose? Right now you walk into real estate as an investor. Commercial, land, or residential? Oh man, come on. I'm a real estate guy. Ah, this is this is like this is a tough question. <laughs> oh man. I know. hey, uh, you know, that's what, how we're gonna do it, you know? You gotta <laughs> ask the tough questions. Okay, I think I would I would go if I was an investor, and it's gonna be based on your location. I'm gonna perfect, I'm gonna only speak on this from a Denver scenario because I'm here in Denver, Colorado. So if I was here in Denver, and I'm, what are we doing with the investment? Is this a buy and hold? Is this a flip? What are we doing with the a investment? buy and hold? It's a buy and hold. Okay, buy and hold. I would definitely want to purchase land within the city uh parameters if possible but primarily that's that would be plan b primarily plan a would be to purchase and hold uh residential real estate it would still be residential real estate for me got it okay now residential would you say someone pick a single family home or would somebody pick a condo or would you choose one or how, how would you look at that yeah, so if you're if we're deciding between condo and single family, it's definitely single family. But if we're looking at like multifamily, like where you're buying a building and there's four units or 15 units, then it's going to be dependent upon the cap rate, which is basically your return on your investment year over year on there. And Denver has a very, very low cap right now. You're lucky to a good cap rate just for the listeners would be like an eight or nine. That would be amazing cap on a property. Average would be five to six. Right now in Denver, you're really seeing three to four. So on multifamily, you're not really seeing good. And the reason being is the price that the, the cost of acquisition to purchase the buildings went up so high on residential multifamily that now the rent income is not as valuable anymore. So for me, I would go after single family rentals because that market is just so strong in Denver at the moment. Okay. Now I have to ask you this question. How does someone who's listened to this and they want to say, hey, I've seen so many people turn real estate into money and a business. How can I turn my real estate into a business? Um, so I just gave an example of my own personal experience, right? So the property that I purchased, and if you're just a regular homeowner, right, what you can do always first decision that you should make if you own a home right now, and then at some point you are going to move into a new property is can you afford to keep that property? Or can you pull out a little bit of cash and not over leverage yourself and use it to buy the new house and keep it and rent it, right? That's the simplest way to get into real estate investing. Otherwise, you're going to have to get 20% and put it down to be able to purchase a rental property. So the departure loan, which is the first type of loan that I just spoke about, where you live in the house, it's your home, but now we live in a townhouse and we're going to go buy a single family house. And now we move out of that home and we own the townhome. We paid 400. We lived there for five years, 10 years. We paid it down. We only owe 200 on it now. It's worth 500. I'm going to pull out 100 grand and use that as the down payment for my second house. I'm going to rent it out. And now that townhome basically is a wash or even an income generating asset on my portfolio. So now I've got income from the townhome and I got the cash out of it for my down payment for my new property 
And now I'm a real estate investor. And now you're making money and you own a business. That house is now a business. Mm. Okay. So you're essentially saying buy your first primary residence. Then once you have that first primary residence, then try to get a second one uh, and rent out the first one. Correct. That's what you're saying? Yep. And you can do that legally up to about five to seven times um, mm. before it's like, you know, you've got too many loans and dependents. Because some people, I know there's a lot of people these days, the generation of like, you know, I'd never own a home. I don't want to buy a home. I'm just going to, you know, buy it and, and invest in it, making a business. But like you, once you go through the home buying experience and you're a homeowner, you just have a much more of an educated lens on how it works and how it operates. So going through that initial first purchase yourself and knowing how you kept your home and how, how you do it versus how a renter is going to do it is very, very different. I've seen a lot of people, you know, partner up with people, purchase a house or try and do it themselves, try and go out of state, buy this rental property because it's only 60 grand. They're putting down a minimal amount of money. And the next thing, it's a headache. The furnace goes out, the roof leaks, this happens, that happens. And now they're not making any money because they didn't really understand the scope of owning that asset in the first place. So mm -hmm. start with yourself because that is a business in itself. That first house, again, we're going back to that a few times, but it's just a good example for what we're talking about is that house is now a business for me. And even when I was living there, though, you got to think just through the, the 11 years of ownership that I had on it, it went from 230,000, even up to 4,000. So just even in that time frame, I leveraged the house a bit, pulled out 50 grand when I wanted to do something, but paid it off and now it's way back down again. So you can use these assets as a tool um, whenever you need to, if you're smart with it. The main thing is, again, don't over leverage yourself and make sure you understand the asset that you're purchasing. Okay. Delroy, I got to ask you this question, Mr. Gill. I definitely thank you for coming on today. Thank uh, you. Definitely we're getting out of time, but I got to ask you this question. People who are tuning in or uh, catching this live or catch the playback, how can they get more of you? How can they follow you? Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm an active person on social media. Definitely Instagram is probably the easiest way. Um, I have a podcast that I run that is all about um, real estate. It's called Agent Daily Dose. Um, so you can okay. uh, search that up, Agent Daily Dose. And then, you know, I'm around. If you're in Denver, I'm definitely all around town driving, showing houses, looking for deals. But definitely, if anyone wants to connect with me on Instagram, it's just my name, Delroy Gill. Uh, connect with me there. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be it for today's episode. My name is Prince Dice. This is the Prince of Investment. And to the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else crazy you see me do around the globe, peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you.